Well, it's a joy to get to be here. Um, so many good things come from this particular workshop, the opportunities that we have to fellowship with one another, renew relationships, for me to be able to introduce my wife, Becca. Uh, hope you have the opportunity to get to meet her. Uh, she is by far the best part of this, this pair. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity. It's a blessing to have the opportunity just to speak for a few minutes about the willing servant. According to AmeriCorps, it's, and they have collaborated on the U.S. Census and a lot of different things, collecting data for volunteerism and a lot of different civic engagement over the last some 20 years. Uh, volunteerism in the United States, even during the current COVID crisis and pandemic, is still around 23, 23.5% over the last couple of years which is amazing to think of with everything else that's been going on. Formal organized volunteering, and that includes uh, civic organizations, charitable giving, uh, helping senior citizens, doing all kinds of medical uh, things as well. Uh, that would, when you think about 23.2% of our population has been involved in that, that would be roughly 61 million people in the United States have been involved in that to some degree. That also would estimate about 4.1 billion hours involved in volunteer work. That's not a little, an insignificant number, is it? That, they, they estimate it. They can't tell us for sure, but they estimate that at almost $123 billion per year. Now, we're not talking about a little bit of time, and we're not talking about a little bit of money, are we? When it comes to even... Uh, uh, informal uh, volunteerism, that's at about 51%, and that includes things like helping out your neighbor or, or house setting for friends or lending tools and running errands, and that 51% translates into about 124.7 million people who are involved in that, and they said they can't even estimate what the, what, what the economic impact that would have. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, Kevin, what's your point? And, and the point is actually this. While volunteerism has been on the rise, even during COVID and the pandemic, it is not often translated into more people volunteering into the life of ministry and missions. Or those even willing to support those who are going into ministry and missions. Now, my assignment tonight is not to beat us up. It's not to wear us out while we enjoy a nice meal. My assignment is to remind us that God has always been about looking for those who will volunteer to be sent into the world. That's who God is. That's who we serve. In other words, God is constantly looking for another willing servant. One of the phrases, if you've been around Sunset for any length of time at all, you know that the phrase shoulder tap from Klein is used how often? Every day? Pretty much every day, right? I mean, you're going to hear that again and again if you're around here very often. And it's the idea of somebody else coming up and tapping you on the shoulder and saying, how about you go here? Truman was good at that, wasn't he? How about you go to this place? Why don't you think about this opportunity? But I want you to know that God is the original shoulder tapper. And I want you to understand that from the passage that we will read tonight out of Isaiah chapter 6. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall we send and who will go for us? And Isaiah responds, Here am I. Say it with me. Send me. The world of Isaiah, as I'm sure you've already heard numerous times during the workshop, we don't know when he was born, but we do know when he was called. He was called in the year when King Uzziah had just died after a 52 reign, shared 12 years of that with his son Jotham. And you know that the changing of the guard is often a time when other countries come into the picture and they decide, let's find out if this new king will be as good as the old king. 
the political world of Isaiah was in upheaval. There would be several conflicts with the nations surrounding Judah. Syria would ally with Israel, and they would attack little Judah and, and, and go in and begin to take off captives. Some over 200,000 captives were taken. Judah then would make alliances with Assyria, something God had specific, specifically forbade. Don't do that. I am your God. I'll be the one who protects you, but you leave the other nations alone. But they wanted to do that to fend off the Syrians and the Israelites. And because they did that, that ended up ushering in Assyria, bringing them right into their very front door, as Hezekiah has to look out over the walls and see them there. And it would end up leading their neighbors to the north into the Assyrian captivity in 721 B.C. There was an economic world in Isaiah's day, and that was not just an upheaval, it was uncertain. God had been trying to get the attention of Israel for many years through famine and through other situations, and, and a series of natural disasters over the different generations. And rather than turning their hearts back to Jehovah, their hearts were turning to idols and the gods of those surrounding nations. They worshipped the Baals, they worshipped the Asherah, they worshipped the detestable god Molech, and threw their babies into the fire. The spiritual world of Isaiah was even worse because they wouldn't listen. They were unhearing. In the same context there of Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, it reminds us of Yahweh's assessment of Judah. He said, go tell these people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous. Make their ears dull. Close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. You think about the world of Isaiah, it sounds familiar to us, doesn't it? His world was very similar to our own. However, the upside-down world and the difficulties that Isaiah found in his world wasn't even as close as difficult as the word that Isaiah had to speak. The word that he has to speak is very, very difficult. If you've been in my class, and several of you have been in my class, you know that we talked about afflicting the comfortable, right? Right? And I told those who were in my class, when I first got to Land Passes many years ago, I thought I would be funny, and I told the folks in, at First Street there in Land Passes, I said, I'm here to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. And there was no laughter. <laughs> but the word of Isaiah was to do exactly that, to afflict the comfortable. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They've forsaken the Lord. They spurn the Holy One of Israel and turn their backs on Him. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or sued with olive oil. The kings and the princes and the priests and those who saw themselves as not only the elect but also the elite, we're somebody that God would never take out of our office, but God would indeed afflict those who had become all too comfortable in that life of sin, and that life of pleasure. Woe upon woe would be brought on those who become wise in their own eyes, as Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 2 tell us. But God would also watch over those afflicted by the unfeeling neighbors. Isaiah would also speak words of comfort. Not only the words that afflict the comfortable, but also comfort the afflicted. And there were many of those as well. The righteous remnant is a theme that runs throughout Isaiah. According to Isaiah 5, most will go into exile because they are experts in calling evil good and good evil. 
However, God will protect his righteous remnant. He will provide a diadem, a beautiful crown. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 5 says, for those who will be faithful to him. For those who refuse to participate in those drunken festivals. Isaiah will remind us that God is so intimately familiar with those who honor him. He says, I will redeem you. You know I'm going to call you by name. I know everything there is to know about you. I'll protect you from the fire. I'll protect you from the flood because I'm the one who formed you. I'm the one who created you and you have nothing to fear. Again, God's word is not all that different today. It's still a mixture of judgment and joy, isn't it? Has it changed? Or have we changed the message? The work of Isaiah. I'm only going to say two things about that. I'd love to say more. But the work of Isaiah. Isaiah speaks for God to man. That's important, isn't it? But he also speaks to man for God. And you need to hear both of those things. The thing that I wanted to spend most of my time tonight looking at was the willingness of Isaiah, however. Because you will remember that not all were so willing. We all remember the story of Moses. When he gets up to the, the, to the burning bush, and, and that's impressive enough to look at that, isn't it? And then he hears that he's going to be the one who's going to go back to Egypt. <laughs> you got the wrong guy. Uh, 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 I, 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 you know, I can't speak. Well, let's go find your brother, Aaron. He'll do it for you. Or Jonah. Jonah was a willing servant, wasn't he? (laughs) Willing to go the other way. Willing to run in the other direction. But not so willing to speak the Word of God. Isaiah, from this context of chapter 6, had willing ears. Willing ears to hear what God had to say. But those ears, listen, those ears started with his vision. We call this the vision workshop. Started with his vision. Who did he see to begin with? Before he ever heard any of the words, before he ever heard the questions, he had to see the Lord, didn't he? He had to see who he's he's going to serve here. McGuigan believes that Isaiah was having eye trouble. Not eye trouble, but eye trouble. Because his eyes were focused more on Uzziah, a king, than on Jehovah, the king. And he mentions that the death of Uzziah was having a negative impact on Isaiah's perspective. Many in this room, I see a few gray heads. Just a few. Some of us remember when JFK died. Do you remember the reaction of a country? It was like, So what do we do now? We might as well just go ahead and fold up the flags and go home. There is no hope left. In fact, the phrase that was used often was, it's an end to Camelot. You remember? But if Isaiah is depressed because of Uzziah's death, then the appearance of God to him is to allow Isaiah to finally understand God is not dead. That God is still on the throne. And the God of heaven is not like human kings. You don't have to say, long live the king. He always will live. And if Isaiah is going to hear the word of God, if he's going to hear his orders from the throne room, then he must allow what he has seen to have its full impact on him. Just like it did to Adam and Eve in the garden just like it did to Abraham in Genesis chapter 18 and Genesis chapter 22, just like it happened to Moses when he got to see God from the cleft of the rock. Was he ever the same again? Just like it did with Manoah as the Lord appeared in the smoke from the sacrifice. Willing ears that move to a willing heart to respond to the Lord And that starts with listening to the Lord. Did you catch it? If you look at the Scripture there, it's not big O-R-D, it's little O-R-D. Who did he see? He saw our Lord Jesus. 
The words of the seraphim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's the big O-R-D. That's Jehovah. It's interesting to me that in Matthew chapter 17 that God looks at Jesus and says, what? This is my beloved son. And he tells Peter what? Well, we would say, hush, Peter. He says it nicer than we would say it. He says, listen to him. Why? Because Peter going off at the mouth, you don't have anything to say, but he does, and you need to listen to him. And it isn't until Isaiah hears and takes in what was said that he's able to respond and willing to step up. When he sees God and he sees where he is and he sees himself, that's when he's ready to respond. And a willing heart leads to willing lips to speak for the Lord. He's had the opportunity to see our Lord majestic, high and lifted up. He's had the opportunity to see the seraphim and hear them and, 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 and witness all of this grandeur, this pomp and circumstance. And he recognizes himself in the middle of all this. And he says, first of all, Somebody's got to come and, come and clean up my lips because I live in the, in the midst of people of unclean lips and I myself have them, please. You see, not all who speak have recognized Jesus for who He really is. That's true in our day as well, isn't it? Maybe He's just some kind of heavenly Santa Claus. Maybe he's just some uh, wish giver. If I throw enough money in, if I get all the right magic words, then he will give me what I ask for. It seems obvious that Isaiah was willing to speak an unpopular message to mostly unhearing people of his generation some 2,700 years ago. And just like in Isaiah's day, our Lord is still searching for those willing to take up the challenge to speak a message that is increasingly unpopular in our culture. Any political upheaval in our day? Anything politically challenging to our beliefs? Any econo economic uncertainty? <laughs> Did you look at your bank account before you came in? <clears throat> How about the spiritually uh, unhearing? Where it seems like more and more we choose what we will speak about rather than God speaking through us. I don't know that it's going to be any easier in our day. I don't think it ought to be any easier in our day. Isaiah's generation faced an exile into another country, speaking another language, learning a culture that they had no understanding. I think that there were are many still to this day who have questions about Isaiah as a piece of literature. But listen, there really is no question as to the integrity of this man himself. He fulfilled his mission. Isaiah spoke until the cities were devastated and uninhabited. Isaiah spoke until the land was utterly desolate. Isaiah spoke and the people were moved far away from the promised land. I've heard us at different times talk about our response when we hear all of the research from the Barna group about where we are as a church in this nation. of the decreasing numbers of members in churches of Christ. And I'm not saying we ought to rejoice in that. I'm saying we ought to speak to that. 
And we ought to speak for our Lord even more. Our Lord still seeks. Our Lord still sins. Our Lord still shoulder taps. We said at the beginning of this that God was the original shoulder tapper. He's also the eternal shoulder tapper. He didn't stop with Isaiah. He didn't stop with the apostles. He didn't stop with the disciples of the first century. He still is tapping shoulders to send, to go, to train, to help finance all the above. Really, the only question is this. Are we going to be willing servants? Willing to be used? Willing to be sent? Willing to be spokesmen? Willing to serve in any and every capacity? I know it's much easier to volunteer for works like digging wells for clean water than it is to actually extend living water And the message of Jesus. I understand that it's a whole lot easier sometimes for us to be involved in building houses than it is in bringing them into the household of God. I understand that. But the message of Jesus will still always deal with sin and it will always be a message that calls us to repentance. And the question will remain on the Lord's lips. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Are we willing to be servants?